My name is Dwayne Cashin and I work with CEOs to help them uh, improve the performance of their company. And uh, there's one, uh, one issue that I wasn't very aware of uh, until I met Dennis Golden, who we're going to interview here today. Uh, Dennis is the CEO of the uh, National Prostate Cancer Awareness Foundation. And Dennis has helped me realize that there's a significant financial and emotional impact that uh, prostate cancer has on the executive suite and business morale and their ability to be competitive. So I'm looking forward to talking with uh, Dennis. So hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Good. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me here today. I appreciate so, it. So Dennis, tell us, uh, tell us about how you became involved with prostate cancer and, and, and why is it that you formed the, uh, this foundation? Well, you know, like, <clears throat> like most men, or maybe not a lot of men, I was going for my annual physical every year. And as I was going for my annual physical, my, my physician said to me, you know, your PSA is up a little bit. You might want to get it checked uh, by a urologist. So I, I took his advice uh, at my wife's insistence and went in. And uh, sure enough, he, uh, the urologist said to me, well, we think there might be an issue there. Let's do some further testing. And uh, when they did the further testing, they came back and said, well, uh, we'd like to let you know that you do have prostate cancer. And the other thing we'd like to let you know is that it's a, a fairly significant case of prostate cancer in terms of aggressiveness. Mm -hmm. And of course, that sort of shakes you up a bit. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, uh, it was just then a, a series of, of testing. And then finally, I, this, I uh, went for surgery. And then during that time of recovery after surgery, I began looking at prostate cancer. And as you, as you know, Duane, I've, I've been a, uh, the past president of the National Speakers Association here in Connecticut. And I started to think, well, is there some way that we can get communication out to men about prostate cancer? And what I began finding out is that prostate cancer is one of those things that men know very little about uh, and really don't want to talk about it or get involved with it. The other side of it is you have organizations like the American Cancer Society that has almost, al almost basically abandoned anything on prostate cancer at all. Their main focus primarily is on breast cancer. So what's happening is there's this total lack of awareness by men about prostate cancer. So I decided, let me see if I can form a foundation, have speakers and myself go out and begin educating men where they work and where they gather about this disease. Mm -hmm. It's a disease that impacts here in the United States, probably close to three million men are impacted by prostate cancer. And you have uh, approximately 230 to 250,000 men a year in the United States that are diagnosed with this disease, mm -hmm. and no one talks about mm -hmm. it. Now, it can also affect younger men. I think a lot of people have the impression that it's, it's only older men that contract the disease. Is that right? Well, there's a lot of fable or <laughs> in fiction around prostate cancer. And yes, that's very true. Um, men as early as age 30 can be impacted by prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And typically we think about prostate cancer as being an old man's disease. It really isn't. Um, one of the uh, members of my board of directors at age 45 was diagnosed with prostate cancer and was totally shocked that it would hit him at that, at that age. And if you start to look at the uh, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommendations, that comes out from the federal government. And what they're saying to men is, you know, you don't need to be tested, PSA testing until you're in your 50s or maybe even 60s, unless you're in a situation where maybe a family member has had prostate cancer. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. If you develop prostate cancer at age 30 and you don't know it and you wait till 50, you may not make it to 60. Uh, the other side of it is that it really needs to be something that is looked at on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. And men generally fail to do that in, in many ways. Who's, uh, who's uh, most seriously at risk for contracting the disease and, and how serious is it? Well, if you lived in, on, in the Far East, uh, China uh, and Japan, your chances of getting prostate cancer are pretty low. If you are on the standard American diet, which is also in Western Europe, what you find pretty quickly is that prostate, the incidence of prostate cancer increased dramatically. And as you start looking at that, it, what happens too is that men who move from the Far East to uh, a Western culture suddenly begin developing prostate cancer at much higher rates. So while there are no official numbers or, or uh, studies that say that diet is part of this, there's an awful lot of indications that that seems to be something that 
uh, is indicative of uh, ways that men could could help prevent prostate cancer in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned uh, breast cancer before. We hear uh, a great deal about breast cancer in the pink campaign. Why is it that we don't hear more about uh, prostate cancer, do you think? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. The pink campaign, uh, if you look at men and women, the difference between them, if you talk to women about breast cancer, you're probably in a situation where about 87 to 90 percent of women know what to look for for indications of potential breast cancer. They can do self-examinations. They can do a number of things. When you get to, and that's all basically due to Susan G. Coleman, who has had a, really a marvelous campaign of getting women aware. The other side of that is women are different than men. You may have noticed. I have. <laughs> and, I have. And <laughs> what happens is, is women are, really will talk about a disease. They'll share information. They network together. On the other side of it, there's no organization like Susan G. Coleman for men. So there's no indication at all for men about this disease. So while 87 to 90 percent of women understand and know what to look for for breast cancer, when you look at the national statistics, about 45 percent of men have some understanding that they have a prostate, much less knowing what to look for. And then generally, too, when men have issues because they don't speak up, they're not aware, they will try to not share information, so they'll go to a drugstore, they'll get some over-the-counter type of, of treatments, and what they may work for a while, but in the meantime what's happening is that disease can be building rather dramatically and being, in effect, uh, not seen for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, in, in some conversations that we've had, you've mentioned that it actually can impact the company's bottom line. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, when you start to think about prostate cancer and you think about the cost of prostate cancer, it becomes very interesting. You know, today uh, companies are worried about rising health care costs. They're worrying about productivity. They're worrying about how do they operate and how do they compete. Well, if you have your a senior executive in your corporation, your CEO, your head of acquisitions and mergers, your chief uh, legal counsel, suddenly comes down or is discovered to have prostate cancer, and it's metastasized prostate cancer. Now you have a whole series of things happening. First of all, you have the tremendous cost associated with it. To treat prostate cancer, metastasize, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars that are going to impact that company's bottom line in terms of cost. Then you have the human and emotional cost for that organization as well. You're in a situation where uh, how much do you want the competition to know that your head of acquisitions and mergers has this disease? I'm uh, very well acquainted with a, with a gentleman uh, actually here in, uh, this is being filmed in Simsbury, uh, here in Simsbury who developed prostate cancer, very successful businessman, and did not want to take treatment because he didn't want anyone to know that he had had that disease. And he was concerned that by, by going for treatment, his clients would leave him. So it becomes a pretty uh, emotional situation for men, mm -hmm. and it can be for a business as well. So at every level, the cost in the executive suite can be pretty high. Take that lower into the organization, into middle management, and to the general employee base, where you have one in six men uh, with the opportunity of developing prostate cancer. Well, the cost of that, if it metastasizes, if it is advanced, is significant. So it's worth the corporation's while, the business is worthwhile, to go in and really begin educating employees, men and women, about this disease. And we say women for the reason that women are the ones who will get men in for a physical examination. Guys never like to go. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, you know, you mentioned different uh, men in different positions. And does it an impact all men the same, or is there any cultural differences? There, there are some huge cultural differences. Um, if, the, if you look at the numbers, as I said earlier, one in six uh, Caucasian men will develop prostate cancer. And if you live long enough, they say that all men will develop prostate cancer at some point. But beginning at age 40, men begin having problems and difficulties with prostate. And as you age, every year that you age, every decade, if you will, the, the chances for uh, issues become larger. So one of the things that people don't realize is that when you uh, are African-American, 
the, oper the uh, chances for prostate cancer increase by about 56 percent. Mm. So the African-American community really has a much higher risk, men do, for prostate cancer. And if you're an organization and you are employing African-American men within your group or African-American women, it's important that we get that message out to them to get in. African-American men also are a little more reluctant sometimes to go to physicians. The net result of that is that most often when prostate cancer is discovered, it's generally in a much later stage and much harder to treat. The thing about prostate cancer is that it is asymptomatic, if you will. And what that means is that there are no symptoms that show. So the average guy has it, doesn't know he has it, and assumes he's fine, which is kind of interesting. So the idea is to catch it early, and so it can be treated early. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding treatment, you had mentioned, um, I think, a study, a bear, bear study and some protocols. Uh, I guess some of the pharma companies are obviously taking this quite seriously. What can you tell us about that? Well, it's very interesting. The pharmaceutical companies are trying to become more aggressive in terms of getting out and reaching patients and reaching men and finding out what is the decision-making process for men when they're going through uh, prostate cancer or, or generally men's health. Bayer did a study that was a worldwide study, first here in the United States and then later worldwide, and they interviewed men about this disease asking them how they felt about it, what they wanted to talk about. And what they found the universally is that men don't talk about illness, they don't talk about it with their physicians, they don't talk about it with their spouses, they don't talk about it at all. So earlier in the conversation when we started, I said, you know, if you had a history of, of prostate cancer in the family, you should be checked. I can't tell you the number of men who suddenly discover when they have prostate cancer, they'll talk to their mother, at some point and say, gee, I've got prostate cancer, and the mother will say, well, you know, your father had that for years. No one likes to talk about it. Mm. So again, it's that situation that it needs to be talked about, it needs to be brought up. And when you have major organizations discouraging men, such as the American Cancer Society or the U.S. Preventative Task Force, it really becomes an issue for men. And men don't talk about it, so the result is no one's talking about mm -hmm. it. Well, I can tell you're very passionate about bringing an awareness to this to help people. That's, uh, that's excellent. What, what kind of programs uh, does uh, your foundation, the National Prostate Cancer Awareness Foundation, what kind of programs do you run for companies? What we do is we'll go into an organization and we try to go in first at the executive level to get their attention and to have them understand really what the issue is and how it can impact their bottom line. We then try to run, if possible, some type of an executive retreat where the men can really have an understanding. We do encourage also within a corporation that people begin talking about this. We then can attend health fairs. We can attend any of those types of events. Again, always trying to educate the men about what this is. But again, the thing that we try to do is get into the women because it is the women who will talk, it is the women who will motivate the men mm -hmm. to do something about this. So I'm guessing it makes sense to get the women in corporations involved in this in some way as well. What, how do you get them involved? We get them involved by really, when you think about cancer, and particularly prostate cancer, if the male in the family is impacted, it will impact the entire family. So women who are survivors, who are left behind or left with basically the uh, managing the uh, budgets, they're managing any type of family affairs and matters. So there is a tremendous concern for them as well. So mm -hmm. we try to say to women, you know about breast cancer and are aware of it. The men in your life are not aware of it. They're not aware of what the warning signs are. It's up to you to try to get them in. You look at national studies done on women. Women are three times more likely to be involved in regular health care checkups than men. You have to take men sort of kicking and screaming in to uh, generally to have a, a physical examination. Yeah. So you, you had mentioned that you, you have a speakers bureau as well, I think. Tell, tell us a little bit about your speakers bureau and, uh, and how can people contact you or perhaps someone wants to make a contribution to your foundation to, to help men. Tell us about that. Well, what we did is, <clears throat> as I said earlier, I was involved with the National Speakers Association, and I started to go through the, the, the roles there a little bit to see who was speaking on what topics. And we've now identified speakers from all over the country 
who have had either a personal experience themselves or a family experience with cancer and with prostate cancer. And also the fact that men refuse many times to go in for physical examinations. So we also bring on physicians who talk to men about the need for annual checkups. Most men, when they look at an annual checkup, say it's a waste of time, I really don't need to do it. And when you really dig deeper, the problem that most men face is that they really don't like giving up their independence and it's, it's an embarrassment to go in. So what we try to do is to get men to talk about that. The other side of it is we want people to be involved, to be able to understand the real seriousness of this disease rather than, I think the, the general perception is that, oh, it's prostate cancer, it's the best cancer you can get and it's curable. And for many men that's the case, but for 30,000 men a year that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So it is significant. So we have our speakers go out, uh, they run seminars and workshops at various locations and that's really the, the approach that we're taking, uh, and uh, it's been fairly effective so far. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. You, can you think of a couple of success stories that you might want to share, or how it helped someone? I know it's kind of hard to just pull that right off the top of your head, but can you think of an example? Well, we've got a couple. Uh, for example, um, we have a, a fellow who's on our board of directors who uh, was going in for his annual physical examination each year. And as he was going along, they were saying to him, well, it looks like you may have prostate cancer. And what they did is they started to do something called watchful waiting, which is evaluating somebody to see what's happening with their PSA numbers and what's, what's occurring. And as his numbers started to increase, uh, he was looking at it, and all of a sudden he had some difficulties with urination. And the problem that he began to say is, you know, this, this isn't working very well. And he went into uh, his physician and suddenly found himself in the emergency room. When he found himself in the emergency room, the next thing he knew is he was uh, found to have a very advanced case of a sarcoma inside of his prostate. That sarcoma would have killed him. The prostate cancer would not have, the sarcoma would have. Mm -hmm. So that's one example. Uh, we have another fellow uh, on, on our uh, board who was in a similar situation, went in for his annual physical examination the same way, uh, had, had the, his prostate removed and was going along very well, going to his family physician. His family physician was monitoring him, saying he had no problems or difficulties at all. And at one particular point, his physician said to him, you know, your PSA is up a little bit. It's almost up to a level two, and it should have been level zero. Mm. The physician then said, well, what's the problem? It's not that high. And he said, I don't have a prostate. So a lot of people mm. presume that your general practitioner can give you a lot of information about prostate cancer. What we recommend to men is if you're seeing an elevation in prostate uh, in your PSA, if you're seeing that constant rise in your PSA, what we suggest to you is go to a urologist and start to look more deeply into the situation. And again, the other side of it is talk about it. Talk mm -hmm. about it to other men. Talk about it to your wife. Talk about it to your physicians. It's important to stay involved. Well, you're doing a wonderful uh, service. Thank to, you very much. Uh, to society and uh, creating an awareness is clearly uh, a very positive way to go. I, I admire what you're doing. Well, we've been chatting with uh, Dennis Goldman of the National Prostate Cancer Awareness Foundation. And uh, to learn more about how you or your company can help save men's lives through educational seminars and workshops, be sure to visit his website at www.pcaawareness.org. I'll give that to you again. It's P-C-A-A-W-A-R-E, P-C-A-Aware.org. Thank you very much for watching. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.